for another Vaughan boundary. <laughs> well, he's a great fieldsman, Philip Tuffman. He often falls over and he's brought it into his batting as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club podcast brought to you by The Telegraph. Michael Vaughan, Phil Tufnell and me, Ben Wright, with you once again. And once again, we're reflecting on another brilliant win for England. The Test team have now made it eight wins in nine matches under the guidance of Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullen, and in so doing have clinched a series win in Pakistan for the first time in 22 years. We'll break down the series win, made all the more impressive considering there was an illness bug in the squad, and we'll also discuss some sensational performances by the likes of Harry Brook and Mark Wood. Wood is clearly a fan of the podcast and must have heard Sherb Actor's advice on how to bowl faster last week. And our guest today is the former England bowler Sean Udall. He made his test debut the last time England played a series in Pakistan in 2005 and he knows how difficult it is to play there. We'll also speak to him about his battle with Parkinson's disease, which he was diagnosed with in 2019. Mike, Phil, hello. How are you? We're obviously reeling from England's loss in the World Cup, uh, knocked out. But uh, thankfully, the Test cricketers are keeping our spirits up. Absolutely, oh, they played well. England, come on, they played well. Phil, they should have won that. They were the better team for me. Yeah, if they'd have, if they'd have scored that second penalty, I, I fancy we would have been finishing stronger than them. I was, oh, I was devastated. Oh, has it landed yet? What's that? The ball, has it landed? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it's bit a of a... Con- on it. it? was a bit of a conversion. Oh, yeah, well, have you seen this clip going around on social media? Oh, yeah. Where Johnny, Johnny Wilkinson is saying, no, 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 not like that. You've got to kick it over the bar. Yeah, and he yeah. does. It's a little bit prophetic. If I, was taking that sec- if I was taking that second penalty, I would have just gone straight down the middle. Straight down the middle. Yeah, at least hit the target. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's easy to say when you're sitting on your sofa, isn't it? Unlucky, Harry. Unlucky, England. Well played. Uh, but I think a bit of a missed opportunity because I fancied that if we could have just got over the French, we might have gone and won it. But this is a cricket podcast, not a yes, football podcast, so we should talk about the <laughs> test match. Before this month, England had won two tests in Pakistan. Now they've got two more in the space of a fortnight, which is, which is quite something. Ben Stokes called Monday's win uh, mind-blowing. Uh, it was a bit, wasn't it, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I was there um, when uh, we won the last time in Pakistan um, under NASA. Uh, you know, I, I would say I think the Pakistan team, I'm not degrading what England have done now, we're probably better than they are. But the style of play that we produced to win was backs to the wall, attritional, hanging, hanging. And we managed to nick it on that last day in the dark, Thorpey getting the runs. There was me, I think, Matthew Hoggard and a few others, 12 men. Uh, doing the side screens to make sure that, you know, they were going over the wicket, round the wicket. Uh, this England side are playing in a way that no one's ever played uh, in, in Pakistan. They're getting everything spot on from the first test, the declaration. You go to the second test, the selection, bringing in Mark Wood for Liam Livingston. They could easily have gone back to Ben Folks. What that allowed is, you know, Ollie Robinson and Jimmy Anderson to have a, a, another sidekick with them. And not only a sidekick, a, an extra dimension pace in the attack, and it was Mark Wood that won them the game. You know, that that partnership that was being created in that chase, I thought Pakistan did great to get back in the Test match, um, you know, getting those last five wickets for, for England quickly. Then all of a sudden, they're chasing it down, and then the captain, once again, he just produces a tactical, um, magnificent decision to put Mark Wood on, ball bounces, set a, a square of the wicket field, and he gets two down the, the leg side. I thought one was a little bit, Lucky, you know, yeah. I, I, there may have been one, but from Alu Pope, that it might have touched the ground. Uh, I thought the third umpire, Joel Wilson, uh, I was watching it on the television screen. I'm going, you, have you not got the same TV screens as me? Because I can see that the ball's hit the ground there. But, you know, you, you, you earn the right to have that element of fortune. Um, England are, are playing a style of cricket and they've got a group of players. They've now won eight on, out of nine under Ben and Baz. Um, and, and, and I don't know what you think, Phil, but... Um, I, I've never been asked about Test cricket so much in the last few weeks. Generally, you know, you don't get asked a great deal when the Football World Cup's on. Um, cricket's right at the bo- back end of the, the conversational list. Uh, and so many people are talking about the Test match team and the way that they're playing and the series victory. So, 
it's a historic occasion what they're producing. No, absolutely. And, and you're right. People have been coming up to me in the streets. They've been getting up at ludicrous time in the morning, can't wait to switch on the telly or, or the radio and listen to what the guys are doing over in Pakistan. Um, I think myself, as you say, beautifully captained by Ben. Uh, I wouldn't say I've been surprised by it, but... I didn't realise he was that good at captain, actually. Uh, those little margins, uh, selection, you know, uh, you know, bringing bowlers on at the right times and these kind of things, all these things over the space of four or five days add up to um, two fantastic wins for England. And, and also just a, a doff of the cap for the bowlers. Um, the batters have got out there and smashed it to all parts like we know they can. But listen, at the end of the day, you've got to get the 20 wickets and it is hard graft on those pitches and in those conditions and they've managed to do it somehow. So um, they will be absolutely delighted with that series victory. Uh, it, it's been great to watch. Uh, Test cricket is back. That is for sure. Harry Brook was player of the match. Um, I was thinking that if, if Ben Stokes has sort of uh, and Brendan McCullen got into a sort of Frankenstein laboratory and created <laughs> a middle order batsman, they would come up with something a bit like Harry Brook, wouldn't they? Mike, you were writing in the Telegraph that he sort of epitomises the modern player. Yeah, I mean, he's a brilliant player. I, I remember him as a young kid coming through and he was uh, you know, a very talented player, but he certainly wasn't the explosive player that he is now. Um, you know, I do think, you know, we we, we always criticise county cricket when, when England are playing badly. But we always say county cricket is to uh, is the reason why these players are coming through when they're playing. Well, there's a fine yeah. balance. County cricket has never been great and it's never been atrocious. It's somewhere in the middle and there's just still uh, an element of change. But what's happening in the modern game is, you know, the likes of Harry Brook, he, he's been sent to the Pakistan Super League and other leagues around the world. They have to play this flamboyant way to have a T20 career. And all these kind of natural shots that you see now, the reverse sweeps, uh, the lap slogs, dancing down the wicket, hitting sixes down the ground, are all because of the white ball game. It's just a natural um, kind of uh, shot for them to be playing, all this in, uh, aggressive nature. Um, and in terms of uh, Harry Brook, he goes to the Pakistan Super League, does great, gets 100 in that league. So he knows the conditions. He knows probably most of the Pakistan players that he's playing against. He then goes to play test cricket against them. And he's identified not only with the conditions, but also with the personnel that he's coming up against. And if you go back 15, 20 years, when you represented England for the first time, generally, you know, you probably go into the country for the first time. You play mm. players for the first time. So it is an era where we should praise these leagues around the world that are giving these players the opportunity to go and play in the conditions under pressure against other individuals that you're going to play against in uh, International Creek whenever it, it arrives for you. And he's a brilliant player. He's very much a, a modern style player. You know, they, they look yeah. at the ball to try and score off. Every single delivery, they're thinking, how do I score? First and foremost, if you go back into our time, Phil, first and foremost, you thought, wait a minute, how do I survive? How do I stay in? And then you think about how do you score? And it was about, can you defend? And then can you wear the bowlers down? Whereas now it's purely about, right, that ball that's coming down at me, how can I score off it? And it's a brilliant mindset. When the ball's swinging and seeming, you know, I think that's the question mark over over the modern player. And I put Harry Brook into that category because he does take his hands towards the ball. Um, and that opens up opportunities when the ball's swinging and seeming for dismissals. Uh, I'd be interested to know what how he plays in those style of conditions. But when the ball's not doing a great deal and again, spin, and, you know, you go back over the years when England have played spin, we've always gone, oh, we're not great players at spin. You look at the way Ben Duckett plays spin. Look at the way Harry Brooks playing spin. Joe Root's playing spin. We've got some great players of spin bowling now, which we've, you know, we've, we've had Graham Gooch in the past. Uh, Alistair Cook thought was a really good player of spin. Kevin Peterson attacked spin. But I think we've got a, a group of players now who know how to attack spin. Yeah. There was a couple of times I was sort of watching him. There was one shot in the second innings where he sort of danced so far to leg that he almost came off the wicket and then hit it to off. It was an extraordinary sort of inside out shot. And then there were several occasions where he, he just seemed to hit it so hard. They were all the, almost the cameras were caught by surprise and they couldn't keep up with the ball racing to the boundary. Would have been a nightmare to bowl at him, Phil. A absolutely, because he can hit your three sixties. He said he's got the reverse shots and everything. And he, I, I, I remember that shot. He came down the wicket, leg side of it, and popped him over extra cover. Um, one of the hardest shots to play that is, especially on a pitch that isn't particularly bouncing, because there's so many. It's just fraught with danger. But um, 
Yeah, he just seems to, uh, he, he just sees it and smashes it, doesn't he? He's got no fear. He, he doesn't, they, there are some players that when you're a spin bowler, you just think, well, they're coming at me. I can't hold them. If it's their day, you can't hold them because you're good ball. They can reverse sweep. Your good ball, they can bop over extra cover. Your good ball, they can slog sweep. They've got about three or four different all, o- options to a ball that they should actually be defending back in our day. So um, very, very difficult to bowl spin at this uh, this modern era of batter, especially especially on pretty pretty docile tracks. They, you know, it, 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 you've got to have that little bit of mystery. I love seeing Abra. Oh, where's he been? He is some special bowler. He's going to take yeah. a lot of wickets for me. He looks good, Mike. What do you reckon? Comes out the front of the hand. I wouldn't say he's a leg spinner. I'd almost say he's a finger spinner. He, he uses those subtle variations. Great change of pace he's got. And, and, and accuracy. That's what you need as a spin bowler. You need accuracy. And he seems to have the lot. What a debut. Yeah, I mean, you look at someone like a Jinta Mendes from uh, Sri Lanka yeah. a few years ago, but similar fashion and you know he was tremendous and then all of a sudden uh, he went a little bit missing Sonal Marine for the West Indies brilliant in white ball cricket uh, in test match cricket you almost need a bit more than just a few tricks these days because of the amount of technology and the amount of video kind of technology that these players can look for um, but a brilliant debut I thought he was getting oh. all 10 I mean he got the first semi thing Surely not. Surely not. Not all 10 on your debut um, <laughs> but I must admit I mean the first test wicket I thought the first test pitch in rugby I thought was atrocious for test cricket. I just thought it was flat, yeah. horrible. Um, seeing a pitch that just had a little bit more in it for the bowler, it made the game more exciting. So again, mm. there's a little bit of a, a lesson for, for, for Pakistan is to just make sure there's a bit of something in the surface because it does, it does make for a better contest to watch. We've all been watching on the TV, um, but uh, we've got, obviously, the Telegraph's chief cricket correspondent, Nick Holt, is there on the ground. He's arrived in Karachi. Presumably, he's going to give us uh, insight what it's like uh, following England in Pakistan. Have you been there before, Nick? Presumably, you haven't followed an England team. You're too young to have followed an England team there before. No, no, I was here in September for the T20s, uh, and then um, I was here in 2000. I was working for a cricket website called Channel4.com, and we uh, we had this really dodgy columnist who went on to Captain England, and uh, uh, he's sat here now. So, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I, Phil, I, Phil, what uh, were you doing there? I was very, very young then, though, <laughs> very young. But, uh, obviously, we've been watching it, uh, watching it on TV. What's it been like being at the at the stadiums? And and can you give us some sort of insight into the mood in the the England camp? Because you've obviously seen a few of them. Um, it's the first tour under under Brendan McCullum and Ben Stokes. These these tours can be quite draining, uh, and in the past have been a problem for for England sides. So, what's the mood like? Oh, the mood is euphoric. I think with the players, they can't. They're they're very proud of what they've achieved. They are very tired, though, um, and I think we sort of forgot really uh, during the second test. But actually, there's a, there's a sickness bug that's still going through the team. Yeah. Um, a lot of the backroom guys didn't even make it to the ground, uh, and they were totally exhausted at the end of play uh, yesterday. Uh, we spoke to Mark Wood, and he, he insisted on sitting down to do the interview. He was so tired. Which I thought, well, he's a fast bowler, that's fair enough. But then we did the same with Harry Brook and he wanted to sit down. So that was a sign of how exhausted they all were. And this sickly bug is really hurting them. But there's a real good spirit there. I think that it's kind of brought them together being somewhere like Pakistan. Um, they've really enjoyed having the chef with them. Uh, that's what, you know, they all say that he's he's fantastic cook and, and, has, and has prepared all the food. But they all keep gaining ill. So I don't know whether that's <laughs> Didn't the chef get ill himself? <laughs> the chef, the first two days... The first two people to go down on tour were the fixer who's with the media and the chef. <laughs> yeah, so it seems like that was that that was backfiring as a strategy. Well, what do you what do you call know, the, the person with the media, the fixer? Yeah, we got it. I mean, that's what the BBC call him is a fixer. But Khaled's our travel agent. He's been with us for the whole tour, and he ate the food at the ground on practice day before the first test, and uh, we didn't see him again for hours. Um, and then he, he, the following day, he said, "Don't touch the rice. Don't touch the rice." Um, and I'd already eaten some of it, so I was a bit worried. But... Can I ask, can I, what, what does he fix? Uh, well, he sorted out our tour this morning, but um, uh, I mean, it's less of an issue for the Britain press. We just have a notepad and a laptop, but the, obviously the uh, the BBC guys and the need a bit more looking after um, with Agassiz's lunch and um, <laughs> sorting out. Um, 
he's been a bit of a connections diva. and things and things like that. <laughs> you're allu- yeah, you're alluding to the fact that maybe Agnes might be a bit of a diva prima donna. Nicholas. Is that correct? <laughs> is that quote old? Yes. No, 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 no. He's just he's just been a bit careful with the food. He, he, at <laughs> breakfast in the Islamabad Serena, he was making cheese sandwiches for the day. Well, there was on, on TMS. There was a very long, a very lengthy anecdote about his cheese sandwich. Oh, that he, I think he got the yes. chef at the uh, the hotel to sort it, uh, and he was upset. It was a bit too big. Yeah. Oh gosh, good man. Um, uh, Halty, just just on the cricket, this England side are doing um, things that no other team's ever done, aren't they? The way that they're playing. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 Pakistan is stunned. I mean, they can't, they've never had anybody come over to Pakistan and play like this. Um, we had a chat with uh, Ramiz Raja last week and he was. He said, I think it'll be years before subcontinental players uh, feel confident enough to play this way. Um, so they're, 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 they're doing things differently. They're ent- and the good thing is they're actually entertaining people. I mean, those matches have been fantastic games of cricket. You look at the Australia series that was here in March. I mean, that was one for the purists. I mean, it even bored them actually. It was fifteen days of attrition. Um, but this has been terrific stuff to watch. And England, by risking losing, have actually won, obviously, but also entertained everybody. And yeah. what are what are the crowds like? It looked like Rao Pindi was quite full, but there were fewer people at Multan. Was that down to uh, uh, the amount of security? It's a little bit further out of town as well, isn't it? The ground. Um. Yeah, it, it was down to security, down to it being a bit further out, out of town. Like you say, Multan Stadium is about 40 minutes outside of the city and they had to go through a lot of checkpoints and, and cordons um, to get into the ground, whereas the Pindi Stadium is right in the centre of town. But on Sunday, I think the Multan Stadium was pretty full, um, holds 30,000. It's a pretty sterile ground. It's not got a lot of uh, character compared to the one in Pindi or the one in Karachi next week. Uh, Nick, just uh, another thing going back to the cricket, um, Everyone's been sort of raving about the, the, the scoring rates and the way the, the batters have played and everything. But at the end of the day, you still got to get 20 wickets. And this England team just managed to get 20 wickets on these pitches. It's been phenomenal. And especially the Seamers. They've got a massive feather in the cap, haven't they, the Seamers? Yeah, Ollie Robinson has looked to me has looked brilliant, hasn't he? And and uh, Jimmy Anderson as well. Uh, I think this is Jimmy's best year apart from one uh, yeah. in his career, twenty twenty two. Credible at the age of forty. Um, but the, but Stokes' captaincy was. I mean, you know, you guys know more about this. But he's he's, he's attacking fields. He's always putting pressure. He's always asking questions of the opposition. He's making them do things they don't want to do. And again. I mean, he showed more imagination with his fields in the first five overs of the Pakistan innings in Raul Pindi than Barrow's Hammer shown in the series. I mean, it's it's just different. Two teams playing a completely different way. Uh, you say they're all exhausted. Are they going to be able to get themselves up for, for the game in Karachi, especially given it's a dead robber? <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? Um, I, I, I suspect there'll be a couple of changes. Um, Jamie Overton might come in for a game. Chance of Ray and Ahmed playing. I mean, Will Jacks was a bit of a passenger in this game for some reason. Um, chance they may give him his debut. His dad's here, actually, so it make his uh, trip uh, worthwhile. He'll be the youngest ever Test cricketer for England, which would be quite a thing. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I feel the worst a little bit for England. This is the last of, I think it's their 15th Test match of the year. It's been a long year and a lot's happened. Um, whether they can get up for it again, I think would be a good effort. Um, and Pakistan do look like they're getting a little bit stronger. Thanks for joining us, Nick, and uh, careful careful of steering your way through the uh, the local cuisine. Yeah, be careful of the rice. <laughs> so we're joined today by Hampshire and Middlesex stalwart and England spin bowler Sean Udall. Sean, uh, you made your Test debut at the ripe old age of thirty six in at Multan, the ground where England have just won the second Test. So you know how hard it is to bowl there and how tough it is to get a win. Can you give our listeners some idea? of the scale of the achievement? Um, nothing short of remarkable. It was um, astonishing to see the result go the way that we wanted it to, considering the time restraints on um, on how much, how many runs they were chasing and the position the Pakistan got themselves in. Um, I couldn't see one winner at one point, but um, full credit to the lads. The pitches are so slow and docile out there that they, to get a result, just an incredible achievement and full credit to everyone involved within that team and the setup. Over the last six months, they've revolutionised the game of cricket. 
Yeah, yeah, Shaggy, hello, mate. How are you? All right. Why is it so difficult in Pakistan? I mean, I think they've I think they've won two back to back Test matches. This England side, as as we've said, you know, with amazing sort of captaincy and positive front foot cricket. Why do you think, as you said, you played there? Mm. It, it, is it so hard? What is it? The pitches, the the, the the sort of conditions and everything, the the food. Why is it so difficult? Why have we done so poorly over there? No change the way that we're going to play the game of cricket for the foreseeable future. I think the, the pitches out there are so slow, low and docile. Certainly touring there in 2005-06 was um, an eye-opener for me in terms of how little help there was in the, in the pitches. And you had to change your way of attacking the, the stumps and the, and the pads at all times, bring them into play a lot more. Um, and you either needed raw pace or, or, or wrist spin. Um, obviously, after the 2005 magnificent tour that we had with the big lads that we had on that tour, Armstrong, Hoggard, and Freddie, um, the bounce was pretty nullified. But uh, reverse swing is, seems to be the way to go out there, and then they certainly used that to the maximum capabilities that they could. And I thought Mark Wood, especially, was always up really outstanding. Well, our, our late great pal Shane Warne, and you had him at Hampshire, and you were a good, good friend of his, he'll be looking down watching this England side, won't he, going, Phew, that's the way to play cricket. He'd been saying that we should have done this 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> he would have loved this. I mean, the way they're playing, to be fair to them, they're playing to their strengths. They're, they're natural attacking cricketers and they're playing to their strengths. They don't worry about the weaknesses anymore or the opposition. They go out and play the way that suits their style of playing, their players that they've got. Um, and there's not so many blockers in that side anymore. But I thought the second innings batting was very mature. They didn't go help and leather. They, they batted with a purpose of trying to build a lead. Um, and I thought it was a very sensible way, so they prove they can they can play both ways. And also, Sean, um, I, I think Jack Leach has come in for a bit of stick over there. I think he's bowled pretty well. What do you think? I think he's done it exceptionally well. He's got his own personal battles as well, uh, with illness and stuff, and he's come through as a shining light. And yet again, he's been backed by the management, by the captaincy. He said, you're a number one spinner, you're not going to get dropped. Go out and enjoy yourself. Shaggy, I'll, I'll ask Shaggy and you, Phil, two, two ex-England spinners. Um, I'll put myself yeah. in that little category of bowling a bit of filthy offspin as well. Uh, English cricket, oh, yes, I mean, fine. world cricket, world cricket doesn't seem to be, I mean, it was um, obviously Abraham Hamid on, on his debut who was magnificent uh, for Pakistan, but mm. it doesn't seem to be as many, if you like, world-class spinners at the minute. And that's globally. Why is that? I th- well, I think I think it's a sort of a cyclical thing. You do get these absolute world beaters come round once in a while, as you say, like the Warns and the Mullerithras and what have you. But uh, I think you've just got, and I think Jack showed it in Pakistan. I think you've got to adapt to your conditions, and I think also you've got to realise what your job and what your role is. It. I can remember when I was coming up against Shane Warne, and I was going to myself, "Oh, I'm not, I'm no Shane Warne," and I kind of felt like I was you know, not uh, as good or, you know, I wasn't given as much. It it was a downer for me seeing all these guys with this mystery spin. I think when you're a finger spinner, you've got to just realise what your role in the team is. Um, When uh, you've got to be backed by your captain, as Sean was saying, and I think think that Stokes and McCullum have backed Jack beautifully and given him these field placings and, and put him on to bowl at the right occasions and what have you. But I think you've just got to you've got to realise what you've got to do, and you're not going to necessarily blow people away as a finger spinner unless conditions are right. And when they aren't right, you've got to work out your best best method of what you're good at, and to get your you know your threes and your fours like he did, and when you come on to tie an end down and what have you. Why there's not these amazing sort of like mystery spinners coming through quite so much. I'm not quite sure, but there obviously are the odd one as, as Abra proved. I mean, he bowled beautifully. What I was really impressed with him, Mike, was not only his mystery, but his, um, his consistency. You know, I know it was a pretty flat pitch and there was a bit of turn there for him just to give him some confidence, but he didn't, he hardly bowled any bad balls. So he just kept the pressure on kept the pressure on, kept England under, you know, sort of pretty much in in sort of like their bubble and then just kept taking wickets. I mean, I think he's a real fine for Pakistan. Just on bowling spin in this era, how much harder do you think it is when you see players playing the reverse sweep? The sweep, the more aggressive oh. now and every single batter, particularly this England lineup, every single one of them, they play a reverse sweep like in Ari, we were taught how to play a forward defence. 
So it is a harder era to keep a batter quiet because they're always coming out. I guess it gives you more opportunity to get wickets. But do you think this is a harder era to bowl spinning than it has been in previous past? Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it takes a it takes a fielder away from you just the thought of having to you know that these guys are going to play the reverse sweep. You've got to have someone back on the fe- on the fence almost for the reverse sweep. It's a great release shot. You can't bowl maidens. That's what's difficult. You can't. The thing is that spin bowlers is bowling maidens and creating pressure. And then that's how you get people to play the full shot. And so, you know, people playing this reverse, and it would drive me mad. It would really drive me mad. But as you say, Mike, it does give you the opportunity then to mix up your <laughs> flights and your pace and your quicker ones at the toes to then actually get them out. Because you do feel, I was watching it the other day, and, and you do know when the boys are going to play the reverse sweep. You, you know, I used to have to try and second guess when they're going to come down the track to try and hit you over the top. That was the sort of their release shot when you've been sort of, you know, bowling dot balls and then they look to come down the track. So you bowl it a bit wider or a bit quicker, a little bit slower. Nowadays, you've got a gauge when they're looking to play the reverse sweep. And so you can counteract that as a spin bowler. Sean, uh, Tuff has talked about coming up against Shane Warne and being a bit daunted by that. You had him coming into your team at Hampshire. That must have been incredibly daunting as the as the main spin bowler at Hampshire. It was, and I was... I worry about my career, to be totally honest. You bring in the world's best, best spinner and the best, arguably the best cricketer that's ever lived um, into your side as, as a spinner who's actually spun the ball. Um, yeah. It was, was daunting, but you made a promise of picking two spinners wherever you possibly could. You see your part of my 12 every, every single game. And true, he was true to his word. He, 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 he gave everybody at that club believed that they could be better than they were. One little dose on every word that he said. Um, and you could back it up by by playing aggressive, positive cricket. I mean, in 2004, he joined us. We were second bottom of the second division the year before. With the same squad, apart from him in it, we, within two years, we were one point off in the championship. It, it, it must have been it must have been something special bowling in tandem with Warney, mustn't it? It was just incredible because you knew you had a chance of getting a wicket because they were just trying to block him and have a go at you. So you could do that again. He, he would bring me on before him, and I'd see all of a sudden I grew I grew an extra six foot because I thought, well, I'm bowling in front of the greatest spinner that's ever lived. Why is that? And I said to him, Why did you bring me on before you? And he said, Well, I think you were going to get him out. And it was something the simple things like that that made you feel. 12 foot tall and, and, and him believing in you was just an astonishing astonishing thing that he was, he was I mean, five minutes before going out to, to field he would always have a fag and a red bull in his hand <laughs> Lunch, lunchtime was always the massive cheese cheese baguette in a white roll or white, white baguette with just, just cheese in it and a portion of chips with lashes of salt and vinegar he had that every single lunchtime <laughs> With, with about six bags and two pounds of red bull, and people think you're joking when you say that, but you know, but I'm not. He was. He, that's just the way he was. He said, "Why do I want to eat stuff that doesn't make me feel good? I want to feel good when I go out the bowl." Sean, you do you talk about him making you feel better about yourself. We're obviously seeing a bit of that with Ben Stokes and his captaincy with the England team. He's obviously making the England players play to their their full potential. What is it? Is it is 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 that? Can you teach that leadership, or is it just some characters have it and some don't? I, I'm a big believer in you. You can't teach that sort of thing because you've got to have belief in what you're saying. You've got to mean it from the heart. It's got to come from within, and also you've got to. If you've done it yourself as well, and you're the sort of character that Shane was and Ben is as well, match winner on his day in all sorts of conditions. When the pressure's on, it, it brings out the best of them. People have been through that experience, and they can relate that to you in, in, a, in a better manner. Usually at this stage, um, Sean, we do an either or. Got a couple of questions here for you. Um, right, either or. First one: bowling, bowling in. Well, you've sort of answered it. Bowling in Pakistan or bowling in India? Oh, India every day. It's pretty self-explanatory that one, I reckon. Uh, from what I've been seeing of those pitches in India, crikey! <laughs> Johnny Cash is the gambler or Ring of Fire? Yeah. The Ring of Fire was our theme tune on the last day at lunchtime in in Mumbai, so it's got to be Johnny Johnny Cash Ring of Fire. <laughs> and you, are you playing are you playing Ring of Fire for obvious reasons in India? <laughs> well, it was it was Freddie's idea, but there was a lot of Rings of Fire going on. I can promise you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, winning the Cheltenham and Gloucester Trophy with Hampshire at Lords in two thousand and five, or winning the T Twenty Cup with Middlesex at the Rose Bowl. In 2008, uh, yeah, tricky. That's a question. <laughs> yeah. 
where are your loyalties, Chef? I've got to go with Hampshire, my home county. I was born and bred in Hampshire, captain that day. So I'd have to say by a narrow hat's whisker, Hampshire 2005 CMG trophy. Yeah, one of, one of your best days, one of your best cricketing days, captain in the boys for that victory? Absolutely. I mean, I was I was the first ever Hampshire born and bred captain to lift a trophy for the club in its history. So that was that was another special, special bit of the day. Um, ODI against mm. debut against New Zealand in 94 or debut against Pakistan in, nine, in 2005? Probably the test match because that to me is the ultimate test of your ability as a cricketer and as a person. Not just your um, cricketing strength or your mental strength. Um, and also, I thought that, that that day would never come. So that was what made it. When I was 24, making my debut for England, I thought that was going to happen for the next 10 years, but it didn't. So there's all to wait another decade to make my Test match debut was, was probably more special than the both special days. Don't get me wrong, but the Test match was something I've I've driven and I hope and thought might never happen. So the Test match in Pakistan. Okay, and um, last one: Ashley Giles or Monty Panasar? Who would you Who would you fancy as your spin twin? <laughs> you haven't You haven't come on here to have an easy ride, Shag. You know that. And also, the follow up question. Then the follow up question is: Which would you prefer under a high catch? <laughs> Ashley would be the better all round cricketer, but to win me a Test match on day five, I think I'd go for Monty. Another subject uh, that we wanted to talk to you about, Sean, because you were you were diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2019. Is that right? And that must that must have been a huge blow. Can you can you tell us about um, being diagnosed and and how you've dealt with that? Yeah, I mean, it gets me a bit worked up. So excuse me if I go a bit trembly in my voice. But um, I had a neck operation in about 2015. And about six weeks after, I started to develop a tremor in my right hand side of my arm and my fingers. I kept going back for tests and checkups, and they kept telling me that it was uh, related to there was a, a piece of bone pushing on my nervous system down my arm. That was what was making me tremble because I couldn't find any on electrolysis treatment. And I just knew that something wasn't right. It wasn't that. I was starting to feel a bit wobbly on the under, under foot and stuff. And then just one morning out here at, at the office in, in Basingstoke, I was on my own about seven in the morning. Didn't feel great. Um, got to the top of the stairs. Blanked out, fell down the stairs, 16 steps, woke up in, uh, in an ambulance going to Southampton General Hospital um, where they did loads of tests and stuff. I was in the neck brace. And thankfully, they did a brain scan. And then about six weeks later, unbelievably, I got a letter from the NHS informing me that I had Parkinson's. Wow. No phone call, no nothing, by a letter. Part of the letter was um, you'll, be, you'll be contacted within six months to make an appointment as to what your next step will be. I mean, six months was just ridiculous. We told something's going to change your life forever, and then you've got to wait six months for an appointment. Um, so thankfully, I mean, I, I, I was just a, that weekend was just a day. It was life changing. Thankfully, I knew a doctor at the NHS who got me in through the back door, and was, I was in within two weeks, uh, put on drugs, and it's just sort of got slowly progressively worse since then. Shaggy, it, that that letter arrives through your door. What were the first emotions when you started to read that letter? I initially thought it was just a letter informing me of um, another appointment just to check over my, my the reason why I fell. So I opened the letter as normal on a Saturday morning, phoned my wife and my son, my son was still in bed, I think it was quite early in the morning. My wife was out shopping and um, I was on my own in the, in the living room. I just opened the letter and just stared at it for about six, seven, eight minutes and just thought, I just focused on that word, that word Parkinson's, because... I didn't know much about it. I knew it was obviously a degenerative um, neurological disease. But a friend of mine, you know, Jimmy Adams from Hampshire, his father, Mike, has had Parkinson's and lived with it for, for a long time. But in the last sort of five, six years that I saw him, he, he went downhill so quickly. My only vision, my only vision was in a wheelchair at the end of it all and being helped and fed and, and all the rest of it. And that, that was, that was my, what my thought that was going to happen very quickly to me. It was just disbelief. You know, you, you go through your life lucky enough to play cricket for 25 years and active and never had many injuries, always played, just enjoyed life. And, and all of a sudden, it was just a bombshell that, that came totally out of the blue. Uh, and Shaggy, now you're, 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 get, you're pretty heavily involved with the Parkinson charity, aren't you? I know we, we've done a few things and uh, you're, you're going about trying to sort of spread the word and, and all things like that and raise money. 
there is no cure for Parkinson's. There's no cure for it at all at the moment. Um, so we're trying to raise awareness by by dinners and by events and by functions and stuff to, to raise awareness to try and find things that will help us that help us those of us that have got it. So to try to slow things down and to eventually get it to grind it to a halt, and we can find something that will help. It's the fastest growing neurological disease in in the UK. There's no history of it in my family. No rhyme or reason why you get it. It's just, I suppose, luck or unlucky of the draw. And Shaggy, how are you now? You know, a few years, obviously, after being diagnosed. Yeah, I mean, I have some dark days. Um, today's, thankfully, is not too bad a day. One of the biggest problems is going to bed at night. And people say you've got to think positively, and they're right. But it's very difficult sometimes to understand the reasons why it's me that's been affected, why I can't do, I can't do simple things, like doing buttons up, like doing buttons up, like doing laces, dropping cups of tea, so I've got some. Yeah, take your time, Sean. Writing, not being able to play cricket again. Are the PCA there for you, Shaggy? Yeah, they've been great. I, I have some muscle reactivation treatment once a week, which uh, they've been very kind and helped me out with. Friends have been brilliant, but there are bad days, and yep. you know you can't get away from that. I've still got a young family. There's some good stuff that comes out of it and the friendships and, and the, the way that people have been reacting towards me. It's been very refreshing and, and good to see. Yeah, well, you know all the cricketers and your mates are... Do you know all your cricketers and your mates are here for you, pal? Sean, is there, is there anything more in the game or is there anything that you need? Obviously, day-to-day, it's difficult to know how you're going to react. Is there anything that the game can do people within the game can help out with on a day-to-day basis it's 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 just it's not every day which again is a bit more frustrating because you have a good day and then the next day is a, you have a couple of bad days and you don't sleep and muscles are just taught you can't move and it's um it's not so much the i know that i've got it it's, it's just a question of trying to adapt your life to live it as normally as possible and that's very difficult some days but the, the game has been, it's been fantastic. The, the supporters, the two clubs I've played for, Hampshire and Middlesex have been amazing. England, England guys have been great. Uh, in days with messages from people I've heard from for years. So that everyone's come together, which has been brilliant. But it's just the, the times when you're on your own and you know, you, you can't get to bed, you can't get to sleep at night. You lie there thinking about things and obviously the pandemic didn't help. I couldn't get treatment for about 14 weeks during the pandemic. So that was, that put me back a bit. Um, I'm trying different drugs. I've got a new neurologist to see next week um, to hopefully to help me try to get through the things a bit more that I'm finding more difficult. But I'm doing all I can and all I can do is just keep positive as much as possible and, and, and just take day by day. Yeah, it's an incredibly cruel disease. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast mm-hmm. uh, and especially for, for telling us about your struggle with Parkinson's. We're, uh, we're obviously all rooting for you. No, you've got two good memories. You're tough as a born and you're in touch. You've been in touch with me throughout this, and I really do appreciate it. Great to have Sean with us today, but a tough lesson to that in parts. Uh, Phil, you you know Sean quite well, and I, I believe you've been doing quite a lot of work with him for his charity. No, yes, he's been doing some fantastic work uh, trying to raise awareness for Parker. So, I mean, it's just a top, top, top man, uh, and and a terrible horrible cruel disease uh and you just listen to him there how how difficult it is dealing with it so uh all the support that he can get uh would be fantastic he's a top fella you can't imagine what he's going through and you can't imagine what that moment would have been like um sean yadal is one of the great guys of the game yeah yeah you know he's been a a, a a great team member whether he's been at hampshire middlesex playing for england He's just one of the really good guys, you know. And, and when you see him going through what he's going through, you just you can't imagine what he's going through. And just you know, all we can do is raise awareness and, and, and make sure that he knows that we're all there for him. 
A huge thanks to Sean Udall for speaking so openly to us about his health. We'll put a link to his charity in the show notes if you'd like to make a donation and help raise awareness for Parkinson's. Big thanks to Mike and Phil, as always, too. A reminder, if you have any feedback for us, it's much appreciated. The address is cricketclub at telegraph.co.uk. We're always very keen to hear from you. If you're new to the Vaughan and Toughest Cricket Club, welcome. As well as this episode, you can check out the last two. Uh, the last was with Sherb Akhtar, which is quite a ride, I can assure you. And the one before that was with England head coach Brendan McCullough. And while you're there, please don't forget to subscribe. But that's all for today. Join us next week for our final episode of the year, where we'll be looking back on the third and final test against Pakistan and reviewing an unforgettable year for English cricket. Cricket.